Father in heaven, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit uh, would take control. I pray that your will be done. Father, prepare us uh, to have an encounter with you. We know you're coming soon, Father. Help us to be ready. Father, help me to, to stand in the background that you uh, may be all the people see, that they may behold your great love for man. These things I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to start off with uh, Elder Haig uh, read our scripture reading today from uh, Matthew 25, and uh, I want to start with a uh, a real story. I experienced this in real life. Uh, we used to go to church down in uh, Rockville, Rockville, Maryland, and uh, I was a firefighter back then. And uh, we would uh, go to the prayer meeting, and they had a name for it. It was called the uh, SOS, the Searches of Scripture. So we would, you know, it was a combination prayer and, and, and Bible study. And um, we, uh, we had a, a young lady uh, one day just showed up out of the blue. Her name was uh, Zena. And I think there's some mythical hero or something that has the same name. It has... She's not her, but it's. But she she was an amazing person, and I think she she was she used to travel for a living. I forget if she was a sales rep or something like that. She did a, she was on the road a lot, and and uh, she wasn't wasn't a Seventh Day Adventist, but uh, she just felt impressed that she wanted to to come to church that day, and she happened to come on prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and. Uh, through the, our uh, dialogue with her, uh, eventually she came to accept Adventism and, and wanted to be baptized. And uh, I can still remember her coming out of the baptistry and, and her explanation, wow, as she, as she came out of the water. I mean, it, it kind of reminded you of uh, like when you, you see the porpoise come out of the water. I mean, she just come out and just and the, uh, the energy. To make a long story short, uh, she met a, a young man and uh, was going to be married. She, her family and stuff, they lived out on Long Island on uh, Manitowoc Island, I believe it's, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's out on Long Island, way out at the very end of uh, the island there. And uh, we had never been there and stuff, but uh, she, she uh, told us, you know, that... Uh, there, there. She was going to be uh, married, and and um, just you know, with, you know, said you know to remember her in, in in prayer and stuff. So, the the group of us. I mean, there was probably what about uh, twelve or fifteen of us. It was. Uh, we decided. Well, we're going to do better than that. We're going to surprise. We're going to crash the wedding. She didn't know any. We didn't talk to anybody. We just. I think it was on like a, a Sunday morning, if I remember right. And so we, we got up to church bright and early, and, and off we went and piled in the van. I mean, people sitting on the floor. I mean, it, it, uh, it was quite a, quite a trip. And they had me driving, so you can only imagine what that ride was like. <laughs> yeah, after driving fire trucks and stuff, I mean, it was, it was, everybody was wired up when we got there. <laughs> Uh, we got there, and there was nobody there initially, and then when finally the pastor showed up. It was a tiny little church, probably about a third of the size of this sanctuary. It was a very small place. And we explained to the pastor what we were up to, you know, that uh, we, uh, we're all, we got our suits on and everything, and we're all ready to, for the wedding and stuff. Well, we, did, we said, we don't want her to know that, that we're there. So we all went and hid. Well, you know, they came and made preparations, and then, you know, the bride usually goes off somewhere and gets ready. And so after she was 
out of the out of the way, we all snuck back into the, the sanctuary, and we're all just sitting there, just like you, with our our backs to the to the door, and and uh, she comes walking down the aisle, and she gets this funny look on her face, and uh, and the, basically, I mean, almost the whole wedding came to a standstill because she just couldn't believe, you know, that that we had come there to her wedding. And um, her father, I think, was possibly Greek or something like that. Uh, and uh, we, you know, he was, he was very impressed that we would drive all the way up there for the wedding. And uh, we told him, he said, we're just coming for the wedding and we're on our way as soon as the wedding's done. But we just wanted to, to be here to witness this moment. And he insisted in, in true Greek fashion, he says, no, I insist that you come to the reception. You know, I insisted, oh, no, it's not necessary. We realized we just showed up unannounced, you know, that he says, no, I insist. I mean, and he was very. So we went to the reception. And uh, it was interesting. Our pastor, who normally leads the, the prayer meeting, he wasn't able. I think he had another obligation. I think he had a speaking engagement or something was going on, so he couldn't be there. So we... Uh, we went to the to the reception, and I think it was probably about eight or nine o'clock in the evening. It was getting late, and we had a, a great reception, and we bid farewell to the bride and groom, and we all piled in the van and crazy ride home. <coughs> Our pastor lived in Frederick, and it just so happened that on the way home, that we would be in the vicinity of his of his house. So we got the bright idea, well, let's go wake the pastor up. <laughs> now it's probably about one or two o'clock in the morning. So we, we go in there. Now they got a big German shepherd, but the dog was sleeping. <laughs> we, we walked up to the front door unnoticed. All the lights were off in the house. Everything was quiet. And... Uh, beat on the, the window and we and I hollered wake up ye sleeping virgins the bride the, the bridal party is here <laughs> and you can see the light went on the light went off the light went on the light went off because <laughs> they didn't have any curtains <laughs> next thing you know they finally come to the front door and we you know they were just so surprised to see us they weren't expecting us I mean we certainly didn't call or tell them so uh, you can imagine what it was like for the, for the wedding party to, to show up unannounced or with short notice, shall we say. When we uh, read this, this Bible passage, it says that uh, it's at midnight when the cry is made, the bridegroom cometh. How many of us are up pacing around in a house looking out the window at midnight? That uh, we need to be ready. Now, you think about that this story was told. Jesus had just been involved in a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They were welcoming him as, as, a, as a king riding on the back of a donkey. And, and then uh, he has the encounter at the the temple with the Pharisees and 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 then he goes to the uh, he tells his disciples where well, I'm gonna I, I, I really want to celebrate Passover with you and he goes and celebrates Passover with the pat with the uh, the disciples and that's when he he actually presents the communion service as we know it today basically what it was is a renewal of the covenant if you think about it he was sealing the covenant with them before he went to the cross. That, uh, you know, they sang a hymn and then they went out to the garden. And um, it says that, you know, Jesus took some of them. He said, you guys wait here. And he says, you three come with me. And you come a little further and say, okay, you wait here and I'm going to go just a little bit further and, and I'm going to pray. Pray and watch with me. 
Jesus was out pouring out his soul to his father. If it be possible, take this cup from me. And he comes back to check on the disciples. And of course, they're sleeping. Sounds kind of familiar to this story, doesn't it? Sleeping virgins. There's, there's a connection here. And uh, I'm going to read to you uh, Ellen White's first vision. It's found on page 14 of early writings. While I was praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. And I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but I could not find them. When a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. At this I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up above the world. On this path the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the further end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which the angel told me was the midnight cry. Do we have a midnight cry in this story? Got sleeping virgins, and we got a midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light to their feet so that they might not stumble. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But soon some grew weary and said the city is a great way off and they expected to have entered before to have, they expected to have entered it before then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm and from his arm came light which waved over the advent banner and they shouted hallelujah others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not of god and went out leaving and, and the light went out behind them, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. Soon we heard the voice of God, like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus' coming. The living saints, 144,000 number, knew and understood his voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. When God spoke the time, he poured upon us the Holy Ghost. Our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God, as Moses did when he came down from the Mount Sinai. Now, it's kind of interesting we have sleeping going on. We have a, a delay in this story. Uh, there's a light from behind that says that they, uh, they rejected. Now, I wonder what that light is. The angel said it was the midnight cry. Does anybody have an idea what that might be? This was a sermon given at the Exeter, New Hampshire camp meeting on August, between August 12th and August 17th. Uh, S.S. Snow was the, the, the preacher who preached it. Now, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Edson was up on the, the platform speaking, just as I would be speaking today. And he was preaching his heart out when Mr. Snow come riding in on his horse to the camp meeting. And uh, he tied his horse up and come walked up and just sat up in one of the front pews there. And there was a lady sitting there and he conversed with her, you know, that it was why he was there and that the Lord had given him a message. 
Now, he had been preaching this message for several months before this time, but it hadn't gotten much notice. And he just came here with the idea that, you know, that maybe I'll have an opportunity to present it. Well, it's kind of a coincidence, but Brother Edson, who was preaching, felt he he got to give him an impression, an impression before he came there that there was going to be new light revealed. So this this lady that he sat down to and explained, she stood up right in the middle of his sermon and says, Brother, this man has, has a revelation from God. Now, how do you think that that would go over if, if somebody did today? Would there be some gasps going on? Brother Edson, he, he wasn't uh, upset about it. He sat down and said, come, brother, speak. And um, he be began to present this sermon. It's called The True Midnight Cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now, have we heard that before in the story we just read? Now, in his, in his sermon, I, I can't go through all of it because of the time, but basically he goes through all the promises and different things. The guy says, you know, that if I go, I'm going to come again, take you unto myself, and all the different promises that, that God made to his people, that he's coming again. And... Um, He, uh, he goes through a, a lot of biblical, uh, he gives a lot of scripture and stuff all over the place. And uh, basically what I want to do is that he, uh, he talked about, you know, the, the proof that, you know, with Jesus' testimony and what the Bible says, Bible prophecy about the second coming. And he presented all that. And then he presents the 6,000 years of earth's history. And he demonstrates from historians and from Bible records and in, in, in the, the Bible using, he quotes uh, Usher's uh, chronology and stuff and goes through that whole process and, and demonstrates that the world is about 6,000 years, give or take. There's a little gray area there because, you know, some of the information is not real clear, but they're able to, to say that the earth is about 6,000 years, give or take. Now, it's interesting when you think about why is that important? The, uh, the year is, is reckoned by what? By the earth's rotation around the sun? The month is determined by what? The moon. And the day is determined by the, the rotation of the earth. Where did the wheat come from? <laughs> There's nothing in nature that has a, a seven-day cycle that, you know, you could say, well, it's God initiated this, this cycle, seven-day cycle. He is the creator after all. And he did it for a reason. I, I believe it was to illustrate in the Bible, we find that there's a millennium that's coming. There were a thousand years where we'll spend time with Jesus in heaven. So if, if you add 6,000 years of man's history, Jesus comes, and we spend a thousand years with Jesus before the new heaven and earth come back, how many years is that? So, again, a day for a year, a day is as a thousand, or a thousand is one, you know, that... God, in God's mathematics, that it, it makes sense. Why would he pick seven for a week? Just saying. And there's a lot of other evidence he gives. We don't have time for that now. Then he goes into the seven times of the Gentiles, which is a 2520. The last time I preached, remember, we, I had my charts and all kind of stuff up here. And um, that comes from Leviticus 26. And basically, it's, it talks about the time of the Gentiles. And, and basically, one of the, the, the one that uh, 
Mr. Snow pointed out was the one that uh, starts in uh, 677, and, and when you add the 2520 to that, it comes to 1844, significant date. Later on, uh, when they were discussing the 2520, uh, there were others that said, you know, well, actually, there's, a, there's another 2520, and that one starts, there was the northern tribes went into captivity in 723, and you go to that, and that, that date, if you add in the seven, or 2520, comes to 1798. Again, that's a significant date. That that's when the, the papacy went into captivity. And what that did is allowed the awakening to, to take place, that, uh, that the light began to shine. And uh, so, and then uh, <clears throat> he gets into the 2300-day uh, the prophecy, which comes out of the book of Daniel, Daniel 8.14. And then he talks about uh, the 70 weeks, which that comes from the Daniel chapter 9. And that all points to the chronology of Jesus. When he would be anointed, when he would uh, die on the cross, and when the, the gospel would go to the Gentiles. And it's interesting that Jesus' sacrifice, his, his death on the cross, took place perfectly in line when the Passover lamb was supposed to be sacrificed. He died on Passover at the precise time when the Passover lamb was supposed to be killed at 3 o'clock. Now, do you think that was coincidence? <clears throat> Jesus runs the universe by a clock. One of the things Einstein said that, you know, they asked him, uh, what is one of the, th you know, you being a, such a brilliant man, what is something that really stunned you or really uh, amazed you? you know, what, what was the most significant discovery that you ever made? He says, as I studied the universe, I discovered the precision at which the universe operates, that there has to be a God. Amen. I'm just saying, one of the smartest men that, that lived in our generation, other than Solomon, says there has to be a God. So the 70 weeks prophecy, and he goes through extensive, I mean, it's just scripture after scripture. I mean, it, he builds a, quite a, and he talks about the, uh, he gives the, the, the Advent people, when he presented this message, they had already been through just two disappointments. They thought that Jesus was coming in 1843, and then, then they readjusted it, and, and, and then finally he comes with the key piece that's missing, that the, what he was saying is that they need to understand the Karaite way of, of reckoning time. And he, through this process, basically he helps them to understand that the way that the, the, the rabbis were doing it, what had happened is their way of keeping records had kind of been tainted by the Romans. And that the Karaites still maintained the process that God was using. In other words, they, they were the, the keepers of the law. And so that was, they were very precise. And, and it just so happened that uh, October 22nd, 1844 was a Passover. And it just so happened it was in 1844. And he's saying, you know, you look at all these prophecies, everything's in an 1844. God is a, is a God of order. He's saying, Jesus is coming. The bridegroom cometh. This is, and then he goes into the types, and he, he goes through the sanctuary and, and demonstrates through a lot of scripture again. Again, we don't have time for all that. Now, if we go to the, the book of Daniel, chapter 12, Somebody want to put some glue on the hands of that needle on that clock? Chapter 12 of Daniel, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, 
but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. <coughs> it's interesting. Go to uh, Revelation 14. Verse uh, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying in a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. You notice the word hour? Precision again. The hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 to 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or evil, or whether it be evil. Does that kind of sound familiar, what we just read in Revelation? Go to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8. Verse 5. Whosoever keepeth the commandments shall feel no, feel no evil thing, and the wise man's heart discerneth both what? Time and judgment. Do you see a trend here? Go to uh, Proverbs 3.17. I mean, uh, Ecclesiastes 3.17, sorry. And, God's, and I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. So we see that there is a time for judgment, don't we? Do you think that we're in that time today? Since 1844, God has went into the most holy place, and he is interceding on our behalf. And like this wedding party, many of us are asleep. Just like in the garden with the disciples. We're sleeping, sleeping. Jesus comes and wakes them up one time. He says, can't you stay awake and watch for one hour? He goes back and prays and pleads. He comes back a second time. They're sleeping still. Does he wake them up? No. Read it. He, he, he doesn't wake him up the second time. He goes back and he pleads with the Father again the third time. Father, if there's any way that this cup can be taken from me, please do it. I mean, he's pleading with God. The human side of him is fighting, but he submits himself to the will of God because he knows that it needs to be done for us. He's looking at your and my face as he's pleading that garden and for us. And he's willing to go through the, the cross of Calvary for you and I. I want you to think about that great love that Jesus had for us to do that. I mean, it was such agony that he sweated blood. When's the last time you sweat blood? Many of us... Uh, 
we think that we have time. We don't know when Jesus is coming. Jesus came back the third time to check on the disciples. And what were they doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. And what, what happened right shortly after that? Jesus wakes them up and says, the betrayer is here. Get up. And Jesus was taken and started his rapid path to the cross. Now the Sunday law is coming. How many of us are sleeping? Sleeping. Jesus has told us to pray and watch. Watch and pray. Don't go to sleep now because the betrayer is coming. But we're sleeping. I've, I've been sleeping. You've been sleeping. All of us have been sleeping. It's time to wake up. It is high time to wake up for the hour of our uh, deliverance is at hand. Things are getting ready to, to take place very quickly. I want to, uh, to ask you to think about uh, what's about to come on this world. We, we saw what happened in Florida in this school. I mean, so sad. Those children had such great hopes. And I mean, do you think any of them thought that that was going to be their last day to go to school? Can you imagine the heartbreak of the parents? How many of us think that we have tomorrow? We need to start making different decisions, don't we? We need to start making decisions like today is the last day on planet Earth. Because it may well be. We don't know. The Lord Jesus has sent us plenty of warnings. In 1989, uh, Ronald Reagan made a, a pact with uh, uh, the Pope. And they, they brought down the Iron Curtain. And many of Advent, those in Adventism, they saw that as an answer to what Ellen White was talking about. That we would join class pans across the sea and and so they 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 began to search they said you know we are seeing signs now they're waking up <clears throat> then we uh we saw the uh the big tsunami that uh went all through asia and everything and killed thousands and thousands of people it just so happened it was right at christmas eve people thought that maybe is a sign then we saw the uh, Twin Towers come down. And people thought, surely, you know, that Ellen White, when she wrote in Volume 9 of the Testimonies, starting on page 11, she, the way she described it was exactly what, it, what we saw on TV. And people are beginning to think, is God trying to wake us up, or are we still sleeping? How much? How much? How, how hard does God have to shake us? How many times did you hear last year? We've never seen such a, a, a hurricane as this. We've never seen flooding like this. We've never seen fires like this. You know, they're record-breaking. Uh, never before have we ever seen anything like this. How many times did you hear that? Just last year. And you look at how many school shootings and stuff. I mean, the wickedness is is just about almost uncontrollable at this point. The four angels are holding back the winds, the book of Revelation tells us. God told them to hold, to hold, to hold, to hold the winds because his people aren't sealed yet. What are we doing with our time? Let us humble ourselves before our God. Let us prepare to meet our maker. He is coming soon. The bridegroom cometh. Don't let him catch us sleeping. Thank you.